month ago. So if you go to Revelation chapter 1, you can stay seated. But I want to just read two verses to you, and then we will get into this, this testimony. But Revelation of Jesus Christ, that's what the proper title is, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse number 4, or 5 rather, and 6, it says, Who, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us. How many of you know you're loved by him? <laughs> to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Here's my point again. And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory, dominion forever and amen. Father, I ask you that you would make us quick to understand. That you would open up our spiritual capacity for the mystery. The things of the, of the spirit are foolishness to the carnal-minded man, but the things of the spirit, we pray for maturity to discern and to understand. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Marquise and Jeremy. We appreciate you. But I want to begin as we culminate and conclude this series on the return of the priesthood where we began uh, about a month ago. Gearing up for this recording on Friday, it was very intentional that we would talk about this over the course of this month so that when we all, everybody say, when all of us, when all of us show up on Friday, y'all don't let it be a Columbus church event and the Hope City people don't come. We come in, amen? It's Good Friday, and we're going to, obviously, we're going to take communion as well. It's one of the holiest days of the year. But knowing that this is coming, or my heart, I should say, God put this in my heart, I should say, was that we would show up with understanding, that we wouldn't just be singing songs that sound really good or that have really potent lyrics, but that there would be uh, revelation, understanding the Psalms that sing to the Lord with understanding. And I found that whenever you're singing, preaching, or praying, or serving in any other capacity without understanding, do you realize what you're doing? You are cultivating a religious spirit. <laughs> Right? It's a form of godliness, but no power. The transformative power of the gospel only happens on the other side of understanding. And so the devil, as the scripture even tells us, will cause you to be ignorant, right? And what happens, we read it in the text in scripture, it says that my people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge, right? So we spent the last month or so talking about the priesthood, and I've covered quite a bit of ground and I pray that for those of you that have been here taking notes that these messages, I have gotten several uh, messages from people and, and testimonies, but I pray that your understanding is greater today than it was on fe in February. Right now, of course, repetition is the key, so I encourage you to go back and re-listen, take notes, pray into the things that the Holy Spirit prompts you to pray into. I believe that you will grow. But one of the things, again, today as we launch into this from week one, really just recapping, is verse number six. This, it's, a, it's one word, but really contains a powerful and significant revelation. Scripture describing Jesus and his relationship to us, it says that he has made us kings and priests to his God. And that word there in the Greek, I'm going to mispronounce this. Let me check my notes here. But that word is poieo. Everybody say poieo. You feel weird saying that? It's kind of one of those awkward words. <laughs> But poieo, this is a common word in Greek. This word is found, I believe, 576 times in the Bible. Uh, it's 518 verses. So there's several verses that obviously have this word multiple times. So it's not, it's not so much that this word is very unique, but it is a word that we need to understand because the word carries with it this connotation of action or being acted upon from an outside force. So when we read here, that Jesus has made us kings and priests, hopefully you understand that there was an active God who was forming, shaping your life into a priest. You didn't just arrive at this priesthood status or as a king and priest because you heard a sermon, but through the revelation maybe of the sermon or the teaching that led you into a lifestyle of submission, as you are now on the potter's will, you have been made Poyeo, you have been made into a king and priest unto God. There was a lot of effort, in other words, put into making you a priest. 
It's conformity to the image of Christ, but it, again, it's a word that speaks of a direct involvement from an outside source of divine power and strength. This is the same word that he used in Matthew's gospel when he said, I will make you fishers of men. Same exact word. So you guys understand the significance of this word? So we've been on this journey of being made. Right now, you're in a process of being made into a kingdom of priests. Now, when we first talked about this about a month ago, the word priest, <laughs> uh, for probably good reasons, triggered a lot of different images and views in your mind and your heart. So we've spent a good deal of time over the past three weeks debunking the religiosity side of that. Like, we're not talking about people who wear special garments and people who, you know, are part of the Levitical order. I mean, we've really kind of come at this from that level of intimacy where it, essentially to define it or to sum it up, it's one who has unbroken relationship, communication, and access to the Father. That's what essentially it is to be a priest. So the Old Testament types and shadows alluding to special group of people or people from a certain bloodline or lineage really was just to show us the transition that happens when we come into this priesthood, this royal priesthood as believers, that through Christ we now have access. Everybody say access. We now have direct lines of communication. And I think sometimes I like to pause and reflect on my Gentile journey and reflect and think like, you know, this was not possible to just pray and get an answer from God under the old covenant. Do you understand that? Like you couldn't just go to God in your car or in your bedroom or when you felt like it, or you couldn't just right now, if you wanted to stop this message and just start praying, we could, that was not happening. Until when Jesus died on the cross, it says this, it's buried there in the text in Matthew, the veil was rent from top to bottom. That's a literal veil that we see types and shadow of in the Old Testament with the earthly tabernacle, but it's referring to a heavenly reality that there is, there has been prior to Christ's death on the cross, this blockage that existed where mere mortals could not go. But through the death of Jesus, the blood that was shed as payment for our sin, that when one puts faith in the name of the Lord and calls on his name for salvation, that blood that's upon the mercy seat has now justified. That means it's just as if I'd never sinned, declared you righteous before God. And this is further why the writer of Hebrews says, now you can come boldly before the throne of grace, and find help in your time of need. That transition from only certain people, from certain groups and certain tribes, being able to talk to him, even them in fear, not knowing if he would even talk back, that whole system became obsolete when Jesus died and shed his blood, the blood of the new covenant, and has welcomed not only Jews from every tribe within their genealogy, but he has welcomed the world. Jew and Gentile. It's a mystery, but it's a marvelous mystery. Are you thankful that you're a part of the royal priesthood? So next time you just are on your way to work and you start listening to your little music and praying for God to bless your day, please realize that's a miracle that that can even happen. Under the old covenant, you would have had to go and present your petitions before the priest. You remember the story of Hannah, right? You remember the story of Eli? I mean, direct access to God was not granted to just anybody, but the gap that sin caused between man and God was bridged through Christ's death. His body, which was given, which was broken, has now made access to all who would put faith in his name available. What a beautiful story. It's a true story. <laughs> it's why we're still talking about it many years later. So you have been made kings and priests. You didn't just stumble upon a revelation or a YouTube video and then begin to walk. The, no, 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 no. With much effort and intentionality, the Lord has been sovereignly orchestrating the circumstances of your life, <laughs> forming his nature and character into you, massaging the fear and the anxiety out of you with tender, loving kindness and mercy, assuring you day by day, lo, I am with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You have been ransomed. You have been purchased. You have been brought near by the blood. You have been claimed. You've been accepted. I'm quoting all scriptures. And you have now been made. At this point, at the end of this climactic gospel moment, you have been made. <laughs> Kings and priests. 
If this was an old school Pentecostal sanctified church, about 10 of y'all would have took off running about 15 seconds ago. But y'all little Gen Z millennial people don't understand what, what it took to get you delivered from drugs. What it took to, okay, I got to get back to my message. Because I want to do the panel, but just please, if you know that you know that if it had not been for Jesus, can just the delivered people, just the delivered people, take 10 seconds and shout unto God, hallelujah! (laughs) My praise is the evidence of my deliverance. So you be cute and intellectual if you want to. All right, sit down because you might offend the people next to you. But sometimes you got to skip all this philosophy and just have a memory of where you used to be, how you, you, it's not your degree, it's not your bank account, it's not your status, it's not the prophecy, it's what Jesus did when he died on Calvary's cross. And if you need to get hyped up to get excited about that, check your theology. Because if, that's why the old song read, said, I know it was the blood. I don't know nothing about John Calvin. I don't know nothing about women preachers debate, but I know it was the blood. I know that one day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was the blood for me. All right, you get five more seconds. Come on, five more seconds. Let that praise come on from the inside out. Open your mouth. We bless the name of God most high, the name of Jesus for delivering, for saving, for healing and setting the captive free. He has made us, he has made us kings and priests. When we shoulda, coulda, woulda been dead and sleeping in our grave, in prison, locked up over, but God, who is rich in mercy, stepped into the scene. He said, no, 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 I've got a plan for you. I've got a purpose for you. I'm pulling you out of the darkness. I'm pulling you out of the bondage. I'm pulling you out of the addiction. I'm pulling you out of the confusion. I'm pulling you out of the depression. Have you been delivered from anything? I'm pulling you out of the fear. I'm pulling you out of whatever it was that was blocking your vision and keeping you away from me. I know it was the blood. <laughs> I know it was the blood. We need, we're going to do that later. We're going to do that later. That, that's, that's needed. We might, we might want to open on Friday with some old school hymns because... We done forgot. We got all this complicated songs and sermons and prayers. Can somebody just think about the blood? Can you just remember the blood? Remember the blood that was shed on your behalf. (laughs) Thank you. Grandma, thank you. Great grandma, thank you. People that were picking cotton in the field, thank you. People that didn't see deliverance in their day but believed that their children's children would be an answer to their prayer. Thank you, intercessor, for not letting me go, for not taking my name off the list, for actually turning away your plate and fasting for my breakthrough and deliverance. Thank you, faithful friends of God. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, just tell him thank you one more time. From the bottom of your soul. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, okay. I really am thankful. Ask the person next to you, are you really thankful? Ask them, are you really thankful? I mean, do you really remember or did you get amnesia that quick? You got that educated and got amnesia? Do you remember? Sometimes the best weapon to use in spiritual conflict is called the weapon of memory. Remember. (laughs) All right, I got to get back to my notes because I want to go somewhere with this, but I'm I'm really trying to help somebody get out of the pit because see, it's Palm Sunday, and I know we want to wait till next week to talk about the stone being rolled away and the tomb being empty, but I need some people that can just give him praise now. Come on, before the altar call, before the breakthrough, now, God, we bless you. We honor you. The priesthood, the priesthood is returning. We have been made. He has made us kings and priests. Oh, God. There's breakthrough in the room. I know we got an agenda, but if you feel something on the inside, we're going to let you just have your moment. But without the music for a moment, I'm going to let the person that feels it welling up on the inside 
Come on, let that groan out of your spirit. Come on, let that thank you, Jesus, that's been bottled up for an hour out of your spirit. Father, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for your faithfulness to finish what you started. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, this is what's driving the devil crazy. When he did everything in his power to shut you up, to keep you at home, to have you depressed, but by faith, you pressed your way through, you crawled out the bed, you put them clothes on, you got in the car, and the scripture came to your mind and said, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. The other song said, I'm not going to let a rock out praise me. Come on. I'm sorry, y'all, but I just feel so inclined to give him the praise that he's due. I feel so thankful. You don't know like I know. <laughs> you don't know. They don't know, Michaela, but God, who is rich in mercy. They don't know, Samson. Where's Samson at? They don't know, but God. <laughs> if you only knew the warfare that existed over my mouth, you would understand why I'm going to become even more undignified. If you knew the weapons that were formed but did not prosper, you would stop looking at me and you would start giving him praise yourself. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not much of a shouter, but I wish I could shout because I feel it in my in my legs. <laughs> Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Victory has a sound. There's a sound of victory. Whew. Whew. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ooh, Jesus. I feel breakthrough. I still feel breakthrough. I know we got to move on, but can we just linger a little bit? <laughs> Father, thank you for what you have done, what you are doing. You have made us kings and priests. <laughs> Woo. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're too cute. I said, Hallelujah. All right, I don't want to confuse y'all. We're going to go back to the message. All right, for real this time, for real this time. Stay with me, but for real this time. Break it down for real this time. Before I get back into this message, look at the person next to you say, here's your chance to get delivered of that silent spirit. Tell them I'm just joking, but here's your chance. If you know that you know that if it had not been for the blood that Jesus shed way back on Calvary. Give him the praise that he's due. Come on, go for it. Give him the praise. Somebody just ran out of a bondage. Somebody just ran out of a trap. Somebody just ran out of a curse. Somebody just ran out of a lie. Somebody just got delivered because they said, I will yet praise him. The power of the affliction, the power of the infirmity, be broken in the name of Jesus. Whew. Churches is gonna have to be a little bit longer today. 
This is going to have to be a little bit longer today. This is going to have to be a little bit longer. Because, see, I decided long ago, I'm not going to interrupt the Holy Spirit. And I don't know who this is for, but I don't feel released to get back to my message. I feel like some of you are in slavery. Stay with me. Some of you are in slavery. But there's a window of deliverance that if you would just choose to open your mouth, to open your mouth by faith and say, Jesus, you are worthy of my worship. You are worthy of my praise. There's breakthrough for you, your household, everything attached to you. Come on, take a moment and bless the name. I'm talking to the person that won't say nothing. Break free in the name of the Lord. Break through in the name of the Lord. Oh yeah, we came to make the devil uncomfortable. We came to make that lazy, passive, intellectual spirit that silenced you. God said, would you be willing to praise me? Would you be willing to deliver me? All right. Woo! I, w- I wasn't planning on it. I wasn't planning on this. Stay with me. Just play softly for a moment. Stay with me. I can tell you this of a certainty, that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And if if the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is on the inside of you, it would actually be impossible to be silent. How many people are filled with the Spirit of God? then you ought to open your mouth. Come on, one last time, and just on the count of three, we're going to give one last praise, and we'll get back to this, but on the count of three, I want us to shake this roof in the name of Jesus and give him the loudest, most genuine praise you can muster up on the count of three. Y'all ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah! All right, I want to obey the Lord. We're going to just move back to this, but just last thing, just lift your hands. We just want to tell them thank you together. Father, we thank you. Stay with me. Just play softly. Father, we thank you for your mercy. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. It's one thing to to jump and sing because somebody told you to. It's another thing when that motivation comes from a memory of what life used to be on the other side of your freedom. When you just look back over your life, the only made of motivation I need is to remember what shackles felt like, what darkness felt like, what bondage felt like. And when I compare what life was before Jesus and what life is, abundant life is in Jesus. I don't know, y'all. I can't be quiet about it. Do I have anybody that can just say of a certainty when you look back over your life, all the highs, the lows, the least you can do is say thank you. The least you can do is open your mouth I will never understand this excuse. It's just not my personality. I don't care what myers Brick told you. I don't care what that demonic Enneagram told you. What the Bible says is that you are to bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in your mouth. It's a weapon of your warfare. So we thank you, Myers-Briggs. We thank you every other assessment, but there is no other assessment I need other than my testimony. I'm sorry. I got to get back to the, the message, but I just felt as you go ahead and praise him on your way back to your seat. As you walk, as you walk back to your seat, just give him one more Shabbat. That's a word we don't preach about no more, but that means open your mouth and praise him.
Shabak, hallelujah. Shabak, praise the Lord. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank y'all. We got to <clears throat> we got to get back to this. I I just felt something. I just felt something well up on the inside of me. I promise you I have a plan. I can show you the plan. But I think God has a plan. <laughs> All right, go ahead and sit down. Sit down. I, I got you in a place to receive. So have to, maybe that's what we needed. Maybe we need to get brought back and remember before we could even hear. Because sometimes stuff goes in one ear out the other because you're not ready to hear. But how many of you have ears to hear now? So bear with me. We're still going to get through this. And I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost to help but God is so faithful. Uh, I don't know who this is for, but somebody is on the one yard line. It's fourth and goal. There's two seconds left on the clock. And if you could just cross over, with the praise, come on, just, if you know that you're right there on the brink of a breakthrough, I dare you open your mouth just for the people desperate, like the woman with the issue of blood, desperate, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. pray for revival, I wonder would we really welcome it if it happened? Because when God does what we pray for him to do, I got a feeling he's not as interested as the schedule as we are. But for the ones that are feeling that draw, that breakthrough, Prophet Tina, lay hands on Latrice right here, right now. Breakthrough, desperation, right here, right here on our forehead. Fire, fresh fire, fresh fire. Korabashataya. In the name of Jesus. No more battles, no more night terrors. We rebuke the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. Loose her and let her go in Jesus' name.
for every person that's been under the attack of the enemy against your mind, your peace. If you've had an attack against your peace, just lift your hands. Father, in your word, you said you are described as the Prince of Peace. And Lord, for every person whose mind has been under attack, whose heart has been fighting for its life, we thank you that the peace of God, as you lift your hand, just say, Lord, I thank you for the peace of God, that the peace of God would rule and reign in my heart. By faith, we grab hold of this promise. The Bible says that every promise in Christ Jesus is yes and amen. So I want you to say yes to peace. Come on, say yes, peace. Come rest, rule, and abide here. Father, we thank you for the peace that passes understanding. This is not a peace that's the result of money in the bank. This is not the peace that's the result of everything going well. It's a peace that passes understanding, which means it's a peace that if you look at the circumstances, I should not have it. I got stress on my plate. I got bills on my plate. I got this and that going on in my life. But this peace that rests, that rules and abides in the heart of God's people passes knowledge and understanding. Father, we thank you for the peace of God. Jehovah Shalom. Mark us this week in Holy Week as carriers of the peace. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Somebody was faithful on that five-day fast. Somebody actually said yes to that consecration. Because see, what happens when you say yes to the invitation to become like Jesus? You know what God, one of the things God does is he restores your sensitivity to his presence. You know, one of the reasons why it takes people so long to actually get into worship is because we're so dull. But when you live a consecrated life, you become tender, you become sensitive, and you don't take a whole lot of effort. All it is is just one memory. Not from 10 years ago, but from 10 hours ago. When, when your heart is sensitive to his presence, it's not even just your testimony, but it's the person sitting next to you. It's the person on the other side of the room. You look at them getting a breakthrough, that gets you just as excited. I mean, it's literally impossible to be passive and indifferent when you have been walking with him. So I know there is something I gotta share with you from the Lord, I know it's from the Lord, but I just thank you for your patience and your yieldedness to his presence. It is Palm Sunday again, and this is why we gather. Father, we thank you for the honor to come and to worship you together. Help us. Just tell him, Lord, help me. We can do nothing apart from you, but help us in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know. We should probably give him praise as we take our seats. But I just want to, I always get lost in those moments. Go ahead and sit down. I always get lost in these moments because I realize I'm mindful of time. I'm mindful of the agenda. But, you know, I've also read in history I've seen it with my own eyes. God shows up when he wants to show up, how he wants to show up. And if it's too much for you, then guess what? You miss out. But I put all my chips in one basket. Little Raven Hill in his book, Why Revival Tarries, there's a section in that book where he said either we will have another Pentecost or another Holocaust. And he paints this picture of two simultaneous realities that will coexist before the coming of the Lord. That as the church embraces this call to seek him wholeheartedly, either we will experience the manifestations of his power and his presence as promised in the scripture, 
or if on our watch, our generation at least will be skipped and wickedness unimaginable will once again manifest on the earth. The bottom line is his will will be done. His spirit will be poured out. The question really is, do we get to experience it or not? It may rain on this city, but not that city. Are y'all catching the drift? So one thing I've learned is that when he, the spirit of God, begins to move upon people, you get out of his way. What happened just about 20, 30 minutes ago, that wasn't on my, I got a, y'all see these chairs up here. I had a very clear plan today and we still gonna get to it. <laughs> so if you can just spare me for a few minutes today, it's Palm Sunday. But I'm telling you, something's in this room. There's a breakthrough in this room. There's a miracle in this room. But what I want to share just a few minutes and bring our panel up here, and they're just going to talk for a few minutes. And then we're going to dismiss and go on about our jolly good way. Halabashika. Thank you, Jesus. All right, these anointed musicians, y'all got back down because every time you hit that organ and that bass and that drum and that guitar, something I just can't, it's too much. Praise God for anointed musicians and singers. They carry the presence of revival. That's a good thing. But we need you in a few minutes, so be nearby. They're such a blessing. They've been working so hard. Give it up for all the music team, the band, the choir members. They got a lot of commitment they've put forth over these past few weeks, especially in gearing up for this recording. We do not take it for granted. They've paid a price to endure warfare on behalf of a generation that God is going to deliver through their ministry. So we need to keep them in prayer. It was one of our, it was a top prayer point of our fast to lift them up before the Lord. So continue to do so this week. Amen. Okay. I'm going to try <laughs> to get through a few points. I don't really have a ton to get through, but just a few things. And then we'll hear from these folks here. I'm going to testify. Is that all right with y'all? Partially why I'm so ecstatic today is because of what the Lord's done in my life. And I'm not just talking about before I became a Christian or started following Jesus, but I'm talking about seven days ago. So I got to tell a testimony real quick, and I'm going to just ask God to help me because I'll be honest, my brain is all over the place because I still feel like going after some deliverance right now, if I can just be honest with you all. But I think this is deliverance, too, deconstructing some strongholds. All right, help me, Holy Spirit. All right. So last Sunday night, we talked, well, last Sunday morning, one of the themes, we're talking about vertical ministry to the Lord. And I made this point repeatedly in the message last Sunday that our highest degree or level of satisfaction and pleasure is found in the presence of the Lord. The issue is not pleasure. The issue is perverted pleasure. All of us as human beings or creatures are pleasure-seeking. And what happened in the fall of Adam and Eve is that the desire for pleasure remained, but it became tainted. In other words, we began to find that satisfaction and pleasure in things other than the God-ordained method or path toward it. Is that making sense? So I made this point last week that sex is not bad. Y'all did the same thing last week, got quiet on me. I said, sex is not bad. But God has an order for how sex should take place in the confines of holy matrimony between a husband and a wife. Notice I did not say between a man and a woman. I said a husband and a wife who are in the kingdom of God under the jurisdiction of the, the lordship of Jesus. That is when that pleasure should be enjoyed. Anytime you break that order or that method, you wind up in sin, and sin produces death. So our, our issue, as C.S. Lewis said, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, is that we are just satisfied with too many lesser things. You know, uh, he's, I quote him a lot because he's one of my favorites, but one of his quotes that always stuck with me, he said, if I find within myself desires that nothing in this world can satisfy the most logical conclusion is that I was made for another world. And what he was hinting at is what some describe, I don't really like this language, but what some describe as the God-sized hole. I get the point. I wouldn't really call it that. But 
What it really is is that you were made to encounter glory, and your most euphoric, satisfying moments are not found drinking, smoking, or having sex. It's found in the presence of the Lord, right? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever, right? And so this perversion of pleasure has led to a corruption of the priestly calling. And so through the types and shadows we observe in the Old Testament, there's a restoration of the order of what it is to be a priest, a recalibration of the definition of a priest. And the highest order, I guess you could say, is that there is a re, here's a tongue twister, a reprioritization of where we derive our pleasure from. So in other words, you don't lose your desire for pleasure, but it is reprioritized the presence of God. I hope that makes sense. So we are prophetically, globally returning to this, and I've testified about it from some of my travels and conversations in the year or week before last. I talked about some of the things the Holy Spirit is doing prophetically around the world to kind of accentuate that point. And so here's my testimony. Now I gave you the big setup. Y'all still with me? I told you my brain is like all over the place, but track with me. Last Sunday... On the heels of that message, again, talking about vertical ministry to the Lord, the priority of pleasure deriving from the presence of God, as I've been doing for the last couple of months, I come to Sunday night prayer, I pull out the guitar, and we're just sitting around sharing testimonies, and we're, you know, doing what we do every week, praying for the harvest, praying for family members, and praying that people will be saved, and I'm just there to serve. I I don't think I hardly, maybe one or two times have even prayed on the microphone. I usually, we're in the sanctuary. I usually just sit there, play the guitar, and I tell Prophet Tina to do all the hard stuff, which she is always singing, prophesying. She's always flowing, and we were there for like three, sometimes four hours. This is on Sunday night. So last week, I'll be honest, I was super tired. I only came because of a commitment. Sometimes you got to do things not because you, (laughs) it's convenient, but because it's a commitment. Amen. And so the week prior, I had missed because I had been in a meeting and I got caught up. And so I said, no, I'm not going to miss two weeks in a row. So I come and I'm in the seat here playing the guitar. I'll be honest. I looked at the clock. It was 8.06. I'm like, there's no way I can do this, Lord, for another hour. Can we be honest? I'm like, my fingers are about to fall off. I look around the room and everybody's having their moment. And I, my actual prayer was like, Lord, please just give me strength because my hands was hurting. I'm like, this is hard. If anybody play guitar, it's hard to do that for two hours. So I'm, I'm like praying really just for my fingers not to break and bleed. And I just close my eyes. I'm like, I can just make it to 830 if I can just make it to 830. <laughs> I close my eyes and I'm not trying to be extra deep here or present this as a normative experience. I just want to tell the truth. I had what I can best describe as an open vision. Uh, So as I'm playing the guitar, I was literally taken into a realm of reality. It was not an imagination. It was like my body, it's so hard to explain this. I was still playing guitar, was like completely cognizant of my faculties, my hand. I mean, but I was out of my body in a sense. I know that's creepy. Don't think I'm a heretic, but it happened. And I see myself on top of this building, but I look out and there's flood water everywhere. Like, it like looked like an end-of-the-world type of movie. There was, like, bodies floating in the water, storm raging, uh, lightning bolts, and I'm sitting on top of the church, and I'm just playing the guitar. And as I'm doing this, I just get a sense of overwhelming, like, fear. Like, I hope that what I've done is enough, Lord. It's the end of the world. Am I going to make it? Is my salvation secure? Like, Have I, you know, is my name in the book of life? This sense of uncertainty gripped my heart. I was fearful and terrified. And then this being of light, which I perceived to be Jesus, although I did not see the form of his face, this presence of God just encountered me. And I heard the Lord say to me, you're my friend. (laughs) Thank you for being my friend. I st- those are some of that were people here last Sunday night. I just started sobbing. That's what was, if you didn't hear the story already, that's why I was up here just, Ooh. they was looking at me like, is he getting delivered? He got demon. What's going on? I'm like, no, <laughs> because the cry of my heart was always, has always been by the grace of God. I just want to be your friend. I've looked at John 15, that story where Jesus said to the disciples, I no longer call you servants, but friends. And then he kind of, um, qualifies what his definition of friendship is. He said, here's the difference between our prior relationship and now. 
Here's where the shift has happened. He said, a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. But he said, now that you're my friends, he said, all things that I've heard from my father, I've revealed them unto you. The Old Testament, the scripture in Amos says that the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Daniel, the prophet Daniel, was referred to by the angel Gabriel as a man who was greatly beloved. So although God loves all of us equally, we really don't all have the same type of relationship with God. Now, that's not meant to paint a picture of some uh, hierarchy of, of relationship, but there are different ways that, based on the way we engage with God and live our lives, bring us closer or push us further away. Does that make sense? So like husbands and wives or parents, this is a better example, parents, you may have, let's say you're a parent, you've got three kids, right? Now, you love all your kids the same. You should at least. (laughs) But sometimes the one that's spending more time, that's actually thoughtful, considerate, they're going to probably have more favor and get to know that parent on a deeper level as opposed to the one that wants nothing to do with the family, won't come to Thanksgiving, won't come to Christmas, like, I don't like y'all. They still love you if they're a good parent. But the relationship is different. It's the same way with the Lord. God loved you before you ever decided to love him. The quality of his love does not fluctuate based on your obedience or your rebellion. Love is not what God does. Love is who God is. The only thing that's actually changing is your awareness of that love. Another way to understand holiness and sanctification is the awareness level of God's love. Because to the degree that you are aware of God's love is a degree of freedom that you will walk out in your life Because you esteem him and the relationship that's been made available through Christ so highly that sin becomes repulsive. But the reality is he loves you the same today after fasting for five days as he did when you was doing all the foolishness in the world. He does not change. He's steady. He is the only steady, constant entity in the world that he created. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our obedience does not make him love us more. Our obedience brings us into a greater revelation of the love that he's always had for us. Are y'all with me? So when he said to me in this encounter I had last Sunday night, thank you for being my friend. I just began to hear this scripture in my heart. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So I was just up there strumming the guitar, and I could not call back the tears. And I mean the tangible presence of God. (laughs) just rested on me really for like the next two days. And I got up out of the prayer meeting, eventually ended, and I was walking to uh, my office when it was all said and done. I just sat down. I pulled some music up on my phone. I'm like, I I just don't want this to end. Lord, please, I don't want to go back to just talking about nonsense. I want to live. I want to stay. Is it possible? Could I possibly just stay here? And function from this place of awareness of your presence, of being fully persuaded of your mercy, your grace, and your love. I never want this to be a feeling that fades. And the Holy Spirit said to me, yes, this is abundant life. (laughs) Draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. Call upon him while he's near. Harden not your heart in the day of his visitation. And I thought, I got regretful, actually. I thought about all the days I wasted, distracted by this or that or (laughs) any number of things. And I said, this is what probably grieves the Holy Spirit the most, that this access that's been granted through the blood of Jesus has been forsaken. Because the Lord used that real-life experience to teach me what it is to be a priest. Priest function from and in the presence of God. And it was never meant to be a moment you have on a Sunday night for an hour. This is the place, as Paul kind of alludes to and actually says, in him we live, we move, we have our being. That doesn't mean you don't have days where you feel stress or pain, but there is a, as John, the writer, Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 4, he said, greater is he that's in you, who's in you, than he who's in the world. It doesn't and uh, eliminate or minimize the realities of life. Life can be challenging, you know. But it's the peace that passes understanding. In the midst of babies throwing up, like what happened to Chloe at rehearsal on Thursday, I was here at the rehearsal, and 
Josh and Chloe's son was not feeling well. He just throwing up, and Chloe's got like all this vomit on her. But you know, I didn't ask her this, but I had a sense. I'm said, there's probably in the midst of this this sense in her heart that, like the song says, it is well with my soul. I went in my office, grabbed a shirt, and said, "Hey, wear this. You'll be stylish, I guess." But we we got some of the sisters. We started cleaning up that throw. I'm not saying life's not gonna happen to you. What I'm trying to say is that you can live as a priest, as a priesthood. We are to live from that place of awareness and encounter. And it actually changes everything. It changes how you treat people. It changes how you relate to your wife, your husband, your children, your coworkers, your boss, your employees, if you have employees. You live according to another principle of another kingdom. Does it make sense? Can y'all stay with me for a moment? So, all right. We go on this five-day fast. I said, what a great on-ramp into a five-day consecration. I'm motivated. I have something to motivate me to do this fast faithfully. We get to day five of the fast. My wife will tell you this. I wake up, think, you know, I go to bed at night, and sometimes I pray that the Lord will give me a dream. I like dreams, you know. So I have this dream, but it's like a witchcraft dream. I'm like, oh, no, that's <laughs> not what I prayed for. I had an encounter with a witch, in the dream, my wife, Ty, am I telling the truth? She said, are you okay? Because I woke up just, what was I saying, Jesus or something? I was like, Jesus, Jesus, you know. And she's like, are you okay? So I'm like going to sleep thinking I'm about to have like a vision of heaven and I encounter a witch. But here, this is what, I got to teach y'all something you need to never forget. Five days fasting, to my knowledge, no like sin in my life. I see this witch in the dream and in the dream, I'm, I'm fairly confident because originally in the dream, this was a bat that then in the dream, I knew it was a demon. So when I looked at the bat, I pointed at it and said, I know who you are. And it instantly turned into the form of a woman. And she had this look on her face like, who do you think you are? So in my confidence in, in God, I go to this witch and I Began to rebuke this witch, but I could not hardly say a word. And she just kind of looked back at me. She was a little bit laughing in my face just about. Then Jeremy, Larry, I didn't even tell Jeremy this. Jeremy comes over in the dream. And Jeremy, he doesn't know what's going on. He starts rebuking the lady and, you know, and, and nothing happened. And so I was just trying to say, Jesus, some of y'all have had those dreams where you feel like your mouth is paralyzed almost. And I just I had no strength to say his name. So I woke up and I said, no, no, no. I just had an encounter with God on Sunday night. I just came off a five-day fast. I'm supposed to be man of faith and power, like rebuke the devil. Why do I feel? And I asked the Lord that morning at whatever time it was when I woke up. I said, Lord, why couldn't I rebuke that witch? And he said, because of agreement. I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> wait a minute. I, I just got through playing a guitar for five hours. I, what, where's the agreement? Where's the sin? The Lord said, why do many people get into witchcraft? You know, the Bible says that rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, right? And what the Lord said was that many people get into, whether it's the occult or rebellious lifestyle, because of bitterness. And he said, you've got a root of bitterness that's actually hindering the level of authority that you could walk in if you would get delivered of that root. It's not a tree. It ain't blossomed. It's a little root. You know the difference between a root and fruit, right? One you can see, one you can't see. The writer of Hebrews talks about this root of bitterness by which many people have become defiled. And he's actually talking about the context of those first century believers who had exited the, uh, the system of Judaism who were despising their profession of faith because of the consequences that ensued. So they were being ostracized by friends and family. They had, you know, initially taken this persecution with joy, but now some time and some decades have gone by and they've become disillusioned because the, the promise of abundant life seems to be evading them. So it was a root, but it was producing a disdain for faithfulness in serving the Lord. So the writer of Hebrews has to take them through the history and rebuke that through teaching the stronghold that was producing the context for the root of bitterness to be there in the first place. So the Lord said, you have agreement. And I said, okay, you're going to have to show me this. 
And the Lord began to show me, is going to get a little emotional, probably will cry. Maybe not. But I was raised as a PK. Y'all know what a PK is? A preacher's kid. My mom's still here. Where's she at? Stand up. Y'all give God praise for this woman. That's my mother. She's a huge blessing to this church in many unseen ways. Makes sure this building's together and prays more than anything. Her greatest contribution is her intercession, but we wouldn't be here today without her. Seriously. That's a movie, too. But, you know, as a PK, some, any other PKs here, preacher kids in here? Oh, it's a lot of y'all. So y'all know what I'm saying. Preacher kids, they always said this does growing up. The preacher kids is the worst ones. Did y'all hear that, too? Right? That's why I be praying for my kids, like, Lord, please don't let it be true. So far, so good. Although one of them got kicked out of Sunday school not long ago. We went to pray and said, Lord, no, 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 no. It's not going to be her testimony. But anyway, the Lord started taking me through the roots of bitterness that I had that stemmed from me being raised as a PK. Now, what I'm about to say next, I do not want this to go the wrong way. I realize the risk, Marquise, in what I'm about to say it is more than likely going to be perceived the wrong way. So what I'm asking you to do, to be, before I even say anything, I want you to extend mercy toward me. I want you to see me not as apostle, pastor, preacher. No, I want you to see me as a human being. First name, Brian. Last name, Williams. Normal guy talking, all right? So, you know, my mother and father uh, sacrificed a lot. A lot. Not just them, but many who worked and served with them. Some of them are actually part of the Hope City family today. If you were part of that original ANC group that came over 10 years ago, just about wave your hand. Some of y'all are here today. The Bookers, the Bondurants. Pastor Terry and his wife had to take off today. They were here earlier. And then uh, Elder Payne's grandson uh, is playing in the state championship game today for high school basketball. And he's getting recruited by some big-name schools. So he texted me yesterday, and he said, my grandson's in the championship game. i got to go support him. I said, please, please go support him, right? So they sacrificed a lot. Here's where I see the Holy Spirit making sense of this for me. Over the years on Facebook and social media, you keep in touch with people like, you know, just through Facebook. You don't actually have a real relationship with them sometimes anymore. But we use social media to spy on people. Who can confess today to a little bit of spying today, right? Oh, I wonder how, so you ain't said, you could inbox them and ask them how they're doing, but rather we just put assessments together based on a few random posts and think we still know people. I'm guilty of that. So uh, over the years, going back to around 2008, seven or eight, I noticed lots of people from the church that my parents led and sweated and gave their all to have maintained incredible relationships. I'm actually thankful for that. But my human side was like, can I be honest? Y'all talk about my parents like a low-down, dirty dog and got the nerve to, you know, this is the flesh talking. I have no way endorsing that. But it made me feel some kind of way. I'm like, y'all got all this to say about my parents and about the church. You wouldn't even know each other if it wasn't for them laying down their lives and by faith. So there was a sense of righteous indignation. So over the years... I've seen it, and I've never said anything because the hypocrisy, we're all guilty of it. But as a pastor here over the past 12, 13 years, I, I realized a little bit of that myself. It's like, you know, you pray for people, you officiate weddings, you dedicate babies, you baptize people, you go through the rigors of, of pastoral ministry. And occasionally, the very people who you went to bat for, who you gave your all to, who you extended yourself on behalf of, will talk crazy about you, will say things that are completely bizarre and crazy. And, you know, if you're really trying to be an honorable person, the Holy Spirit won't even let you defend yourself. He'll say, nope, zip it, don't say a word. So you just have to sit there sometimes as a leader and observe the slander, the gossip, the lies, and, and process the betrayal as if you're not even a human. Now, we understand his grace is sufficient, so people keep pressing on but I realized through this dream that if I was going to get delivered 
of that, I had to be able to own that, first of all. And I'm giving an object lesson to you here today. Come out of denial. When the Holy Spirit said there's an agreement, I'm like, no, it can't be. I, I, I don't know. I'm not. I don't. It's like, no, let me, let me show you some areas of your heart. That is the point of consecration, by the way. And I didn't realize that I had been holding on for, you know, 15 years, just, you know, unresolved stuff in my heart. Nothing that I would ever act on. I never was funny acting toward people. But y'all know how it is. You smile and say hi, but deep down you're like, okay, I got it over with. Leave me alone. <laughs> Do you have any real people here today? I'm talking about people who just got through shouting. All right, so I kind of normalized this, and the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 no. This is not the way of the kingdom. See, when Jesus was on the cross, he was wounded for our transgressions, but he was also bruised for our iniquity. A transgression, if you want to sum it up, is a sin that you can see. And iniquity is sin in the heart that nobody sees. So when he died on the cross, it wasn't just to deal with our bad habits, bad behaviors, and bad words. It was also to deal with the iniquity of our heart. And so as I was praying through that the other day, it was a lot. And just yesterday in Atlanta, I went to a funeral because one of the members of our church from my childhood uh, passed away. If we can put her picture on the screen, I want to show you this beautiful woman of God. Her name is Patricia Smith. We should have it back there. This is her. Some of you ANC people remember her. Her sons, Terry and Gary, they were childhood friends of mine. And uh, she went on to be with the Lord. She Keep the picture up there for a moment. She uh, moved to Columbus in the mid-'90s and was a part of our church for maybe 10, 12 years and was just such a blessing. Everybody who knew her loved her. And so her sons, uh, about my age, a little bit older, we became really close friends. So when I heard that she passed away, I said, I, I got to make this funeral. So I bought a plane ticket, flew to Atlanta yesterday morning, flew back to Columbus last night, got home around midnight. But I wouldn't miss this for the world. So I'm at this funeral, and this is how God works, y'all. And guess who I see? All the former All Nations Church members that have become best friends, that have some of them gotten married, had children, but here's where the Holy Ghost delivered me. Because as I sat there and as I looked at some of these people and I saw the change that had, the good changes that had been wrought in their life, instead of me having this quiet disdain in my heart, I was actually so thankful that my mom and my dad and the many others who laid down their life to birth a ministry that provided a context for them to even meet that the fruit still remains. We would define fruit that remains as people who still attend the church. But the real fruit is the relationships, the covenantal sisterhood and brotherhood that is formed. And so my posture shifted from entitlement and irritation to humility and thankfulness. As I looked around this room and the picture here, just show the picture of Salem Missionary Baptist Church this is the church where the funeral was held at yesterday. Now, the, I want to show you this because in, this church actually was founded in 1810. Now, this is during the times of slavery in the state of Georgia, and the history is in, incredible. But long story short is that the pastors and the founding family of this church, which is, is over how many years, 200-something years old, their families have stayed connected all these years. And so Patricia Smith, I learned this yesterday, that her great-grandfather or grandfather, I think it was, was the pastor of this church for 40 some years or something like that. And long story short is that she moved to Ohio, became apostolic, got filled with the Holy Ghost, you know, things like that, grew greatly in this season of her life called the 90s and early 2000s, and then went back to Atlanta when her parents started to get of age. And so this was the church that not only was she raised in, but this is the church that her, her uh, ancestors founded who were slaves, which is a powerful story. So here we are at the homegoing service, and the pastor gets up, the current pastor, and he, you know, he says, you know, because the members of the family are all there, and they're talking about the times of the past. And he said, like, you know, I'm, uh, he's an older guy. He said, I've only, I've only been the pastor for 36 years, and so, you know, I can't really say much about our history. I'm like, 36? I'm barely, I just turned 36 like a year and a half ago. Like, you know, 
And I was just, it just gave me some perspective of what this is really all about. The priesthood. I'm still talking about the priesthood. Even if you're not connecting the dots, hear me out. Please honor this moment because some of you are on the verge of losing out on your inheritance because you're not hearing what the Spirit is saying. I looked around that room. There were not just members of All Nations Church, but members of, I think, three or four churches that she had at some point been a part of. And all of those connections were still intact. There was a group of women that she met here in Columbus. One of them's name is Evelyn Turnbow. She's a pastor. Her and her husband lead a ministry in the Virgin Islands. And they had a covenant pact to pray every day together at 5 o'clock in the morning for different people to get saved. So I haven't seen Evelyn in many years. And there's make sure the volume is up. But I saw her yesterday. And before you play it, let me tell you this. She was so ecstatic to see me. She said, you know, I can't believe it's amazing to see what God's doing in your life right now. She's like, you have no idea, but we prayed and we fasted for you every day for two years when we saw you drifting from God as a child. I had no idea. So there's a video. I said, I got to record this. I don't think people would believe me. So turn the volume up and Go ahead and play that. Hopefully, it'll play. But this is this wow. Wow. She met me when I was a child. That's her. A child. <laughs> yeah. But listen, we saw the anointing on his life. And everybody thought it was his brother because his brother was more outgoing. He was quiet. And everybody thought that his brother was going to be the one to step into the ministry. But the Lord impressed upon me that it was going to be him. And for two years, two years, we fasted and we prayed every Monday. And sometimes it was hard to do it, but we did. And today, I'm so happy to know what the Lord is doing in his life. So, Prayers work. We're Prayers reaping work. what. So, Amen. So thank you. Amen. God is faithful. <laughs> God is faithful. Wow. And so, just three days before that, I got a message from, I wish I had pictures that show you this too, but I got a message from a lady named Mary, her and her sister Joy. Some of you may remember Mary and Joy Worsham. Uh, they were members here for a number of years. They ended up moving to Virginia to help their parents with the ministry there. Their parents are getting up in age. And I said, hey, this is all I'm asking. When you go back to Virginia, would you please pray for me? You know, kind of like a goodbye, like just keep me in your prayers kind of thing. I thought nothing of it. Just the other day, or three days before that, I got a message from Mary on Facebook, and she said, hey, I just want to ask if you would pray uh, for the prayer group, the lead intercessor who started the prayer group. Um, she's somewhere between 85 and 90 years old. They don't actually know how old she is because black people often didn't get birth certificates back in the day. Did y'all know that? So she said, they've been praying for you every day. Monday through Friday at 6 a.m., she said, it would mean the world to them if you just hopped on the prayer line and announced yourself and told them who you were to let them know that uh, their prayers have broken through. I had, this has been going on, I think, since 2015. For nine years, I've been carried on the wings of intercessors. We've all been carried on the wings of intercessors. We're standing on the foundation of people who gave, who tithed, who vowed to give huge chunks of money to buy this land, to build this building, who didn't run away when the young 27-year-old pastor was presented to them by my dad as his candidate. They could have said, I was his Sunday school teacher, like Lolita Wallace was, and said, oh, I got kids older than him. How could I submit to a pastor younger than my own kids? It's called not knowing people by the flesh, but by the spirit. And I can only imagine. I never asked her this, but I can only imagine. And this would go for Sister Corday and all of you guys. There were probably some things that me as a 27-year-old pastor did or said or questions. You wondered, where are the old songs? Why is it so dark in here? <laughs> they used to say, like, can we... Sing some songs we know. <laughs> and in my stupid, arrogant youth, I thought those kind of things were just religion, trying to stop the wave of revival. Can I tell you, may I repent publicly for the arrogance 
that I had unknowingly as a younger leader for not knowing people by the Spirit. And yesterday, when I was there, there was about 50, 40 or 50 people from all over that came that specifically connected in Columbus, Ohio during that 10, 12, 14 year period of time. We all took a group photo and I, you know, I'm the PK, so I heard all the stories. I know the, I know the T. I know, I know all of it because you grew up as a PK, you overhear every conversation. Like they did what? That's so-and-so's baby? Oh my God. How, you know, so I, you know, I grew up and I'm seeing them and I'm like, wow. The labor was not in vain. Yeah, it was bumpy for a while, but look now. We're all here together, united by the blood of the Lamb. And so God used my trip yesterday to uproot the root of bitterness. And he basically said to me, the whole story, one, it's not over. And two, it's not all bad. And I think maybe I can shed some perspective for people who've been interpreting your past through the wrong lens. What happened to Joseph was definitely an injustice. It was unfair. He was lied on. He was betrayed by his own brothers. He was falsely accused of rape by Potiphar's wife. He went through more than you could imagine. And when his brothers come, you know why he was actually favored by God? Because he had no root of bitterness. And what he said to his brother is what I believe God wants us to be able to say to our situation. You did maybe mean this for evil. But God has turned it around, not just for my deliverance, but for your deliverance, and not just for our deliverance, but for a future generation. Had he been bitter, he would have blocked the blessing that God wanted to bring upon the entirety of, that, of, that, of the tribes, the tribe, the 12 tribes. And so, y'all forgive me. I know that we have a plan, but I didn't expect it to go this way. Um, so how can I kind of wrap this up? Oh, this is, I got to say this to you as well. Um, when I noticed at the funeral yesterday, he, hear me, I'm almost done here. As I looked around the room, I said, okay, there was thousands of people who called this church or that church home over the years. Why did these people show up? And you know what they had in common? The ones that were there at the end, those were the ones who truly loved her, but those were the ones who actually prayed together. They had made a covenant together as a band of sisters to pray together at 5 o'clock in the morning. This was like over 20 years ago that they did this. And to their death, they were in the room where she took her last breath with the word of God on post-it notes all around the room, claiming her healing, believing for a miracle. They were faithful together to the end because they prayed together. And I want to say this about spiritual coverings. And about what the purpose of the church actually is, there is a biblical precedent for Elijah, Elisha, for Paul, for Timothy. You see that kind of idea, Naomi and Ruth. That's not a bizarre thought. But the true beauty of the church is not that there's some powerful anointed leader who has unlimited access to you and vice versa. The beauty of the church is that every joint supplies what's needed for the body. And Though my dad, to my knowledge, never hopped on the prayer call line, it was his teachings that produced the unction to form the prayer call line. And it was the prayers that were prayed on the prayer call line that led to the deliverance and salvation of people's children and grandchildren and the salvation of people's marriages and miracles that only eternity will tell us the full story of. So I got a bird's eye view of why we gather, why we form, why we are called together as a spiritual family what God is attempting to do in the world today is not built on the strength of a preacher or a singer. It's built on the strength of covenantal love that the entire community says yes to. And that's what hell fears. If you only come to church because you really like my preaching, you'll leave as soon as I don't appeal to you anymore. <laughs> if you only come to this church because you love their singing, you will leave because they'll start singing something you don't like anymore. But when God joins us together in the body we're joined together for a purpose that is not even in just limited to time, but for eternity. And so yesterday I observed this, and here's the last thing I'll say. There were speakers and testimonies, and these testimonies actually 
were from every stage of her life. She died as a pretty young woman. She was only 62, I believe. Just really young. But she lived a full life. But what was interesting is different people shared. There's two main things that I noticed. One, everyone talked about her pound cake. She was known for her pound cake. She used to cook it, for, make it for me and my, my brother all the time. But people talked about their, her impact in their life at every stage of her life. So we call it your prime or your peak years where like, okay, between 30 and 50, you really did a lot of great. But from, you know, 50 to 90 or however old you are when you pass on, you just kind of sat there. And I'm, I'm going to say this, hear me please, in a humility, posture of humility, I, I want to say something to those of you who are at the latter stages of your life, who maybe have grandchildren or of that age or stage of life to begin having them or Maybe you're retired. The Lord asked me to, and this is for young people too, but specifically for those who are older. How do you want your story to finish? If you look this up online, the life expectancy, now this is a huge sample size, but the life expectancy is between 78 and 80 years old, depending on certain lifestyle habits and gender and and all these other factors. Let's just say 80 on the optimistic side. Now, of course, there's outliers. There's a lot of people who are much older than that when they pass, but there are also people who are 62. So the average is 80 or so. If you are, let's just say, 60 or older, you have fulfilled three out of four chapters. Will your last chapter be your best chapter? Or will this last chapter of your life be spent reflecting on the first two or three. And I felt like the Lord said to encourage those who are older in this church that you have so much to give, so much to offer, so much more to impart, so much more wisdom. Your pinnacle of life was not at your peak earning years or when you had the title. You say, well, I'm retired. I'm sitting at home. I'm just, no, 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 no. You have so much still to offer. And I felt the burden of the Lord about that because, again, as a younger leader, I don't think I recognized that wisdom that was just so readily accessible. And I want to tell men and women who are younger here, you don't always need a meeting with me. If I want to get some counsel on marriage, talk to a Pastor Terry, a Dr. Gordon, an elder. Talk to one of these guys. I'm not calling you old, but talk to these seasoned guys and gals, these ladies. You got debates about modesty, what's proper, what's not proper. Talk to someone who wasn't raised on MTV or TikTok. They might have something to offer. I mean, you're getting counsel from people whose frame of reference is TikTok, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go there. But I'm just saying, I mean, you, you, Apostle Val is one of the most stylish people I know. You got to stand it up. You might as well stand up. Let, let, we got the orange on the day. <laughs> but let, let, me, let me soft rebuke young people who think her vision, her understanding of modesty is inferior to your favorite TikToker, your favorite TikToker, your favorite blogger, your influencer who is showing parts of their body to get clicks, likes, and shares to make money, who has monetized their body. It's called prostitution, actually. So we'd rather get counsel from online prostitutes than people who've walked with God for decades. I'm just saying, you don't need to answer the altar call. You need to be humble and ask questions and take notes and then do what was told to you. I'm really, I'm trying to be nice. But listen, these roots of bitterness, I didn't know were there until the Lord showed me. So that was the question the Lord put before me to ask you, how do you want to finish your story One thing about Patricia, can we put her picture back up there? I dedicate this service to her, by the way. But one thing that was mentioned over and over again at her homegoing celebration, 
as is true with every saint of God that gives their life to the Lord at a young age, that she lived full, but she died empty. So we don't know if we're going to make it to 92, 102, 82, or 62. But you can live full and aim to die empty. To die empty is what the Apostle Paul was saying. He said, my life is being poured out as a drink offering. And he implores us to do the same. Okay, y'all have been patient. So last thing I'll say here. I got to look in my notes because I wrote this on the plane. Hold on. At the judgment seat of Christ, which I think of often, I encourage you to think of often, the only regrets I think we'll have is how little we actually believed God, <laughs> how little we probably actually took fasting and prayer seriously. But you know what I think my personal biggest regret will be was how at seasons of my life, how unwilling I was to forgive. Forgiveness is supernatural. Growing up as a PK and currently as a pastor, I could vindicate myself. I could tell you stories of how my parents were lied on, how my church was, you know, I could go through that whole thing, pull out the receipts. But do you really want to go to the judgment seat of Christ with receipts? Because guess who has receipts and that's why the Bible warns you, if he were to keep receipts, or actually, that's a Gen Z Bible, but he said, if he were to mark iniquities, King James, who would be able to stand? So this is a simple, full circle moment. That church, Salem Missionary Baptist Church, started in the midst of slavery. 1810. Go to their website and read their history. It's unbelievable. And here we are in 2024, sitting there, sitting there, I should say, standing there on the shoulders of a priesthood of people who came before them, before me, before we were even a thought, before our parents' parents' parents were even a thought. And as I sat there and as I looked around, I actually began to repent during the funeral. And instead of thinking about all the things that I feel I lost as a child, I, our sister Tamara is doing a live on April 20th on Instagram about something like emotional healing or something like that, right? She's a licensed therapist or something like that. I don't know your actual title, so forgive me. <laughs> but I've seen something she posts about something like healing your inner childhood or something like that. Because there are a lot of people who think you can preach over top of this stuff. And to a measure, you can be effective. But can I tell you, when God gets ready to do something really significant through your life, he said, no, 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 we're not, we not pretending that's not there. I don't care if you just got through fasting. You don't need more anointing. You need to get rid of this root. The fast, hear me, the fast was to get you tender enough to hear the rebuke. Because if you wouldn't have been consecrated, you would have thought that was a spirit of accusation coming from the devil. But what it really was, was the mercy of God. Yeah, you preacher man, you who cast devils out of people. Have you not read in Matthew 7, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons? Did we not prophesy? Did we not do many wonders in your name? And I will say to them, depart from me, you workers of transgression. No, depart from me, you worker of what? Y'all didn't catch that. Worker of iniquity. Your outside cup, your outside ministry, poof, you passed that test. You did trainings on it, but you've been working iniquity. You've been rebelling. You've been working witchcraft by your unforgiveness. Let me say it a different way. You've been agreeing with the same source behind witchcraft by refusing to forgive. He said, bless them that curse you. Pray for them that spitefully use you. Not lip service, not just talking out the side of your neck, but from the heart, in view of the cross, in view of the blood that we just got so happy about, extend mercy to them. For years until yesterday, I looked at my childhood as an obstacle 
I had to endure and overcome. Didn't even want to get married or have my own kids until I fell in love with that pretty little thing over there. But here's the truth. I'm not lying. No cap. I wanted to try that. <laughs> Sorry. But I actually didn't want to get, I was calling it being a Nazarite, and to some extent it was, but truthfully what was underneath that Nazarite talk of my 20s was a fear of marriage, a fear of covenant, because I'm like, I'm called to ministry. The last thing in the world I want to do is have my kids raised with church people. Church people this, church people bitter, church people blame it, church people drive me crazy. I don't, I'll be an evangelist. I don't want to be a pastor, because evangelists preach and leave and go to the next town. I'll do that for the rest of my life. Dealing with people of God, that's, that's a, Lord, so gradually, for the past 12 and a half years, the Lord been chipping away at the callousness of the heart. Oh, he's still going to use you. He'll still let you help other people, but he's like, you know what? It's not a greater anointing. It's a heart like Jesus. Yesterday, I sat there and I took a picture and I now know why the Lord impressed on me so heavily to go. Like the plane ticket was extremely expensive. Last minute plane tickets are high. By the way, I'm raising money for India if anybody wants to help me, but side note, plane ticket cost me $700. Actually more than that when you factor in the $80 Uber to get to the church where the funeral was and an $80 Uber to get back. And But what price tag would you put on your own deliverance? Y'all, that, go watch the replay. This, so I was on the plane last night at getting off the plane around midnight and I was, you know, if you fly into Columbus, they got all this Columbus propaganda. <laughs> Like everywhere, Columbus is coming together as one. Y'all seen those signs at the airport? It's like everywhere. It's like Columbus City, Columbus marketing campaign to get people to move here. Last time, ooh, I'm going to confess something else. Last time I had a flight, it was actually uh, to preach at a conference a few weeks back. I got off the plane, and my honest thought was like, man, this city reminds me so much of painful things. Lord, are you sure you want me to spend the rest of my life here? It's cold again. <laughs> I even told one of my pastor friends, I said, man, pray for me because for the first time in a long time when I got off the plane the other day, I didn't feel like I was coming home. I felt like I was coming to an assignment that I just have to finish and be faithful to by faith. You know, a healed heart will change your perspective. So <laughs> tired as I was, I get off the plane, I see all the same old, same old Columbus propaganda. And truthfully, if I could, I would have hugged the wall. And I just thought to myself, man, it feels good to be home. And um, we are uh, calling for a return to the priesthood. Constance and the team, we meet every Thursday to do planning meetings and talk through this whole project. And they've been debating with me on whether I should be involved or not because they're like, well, you're the one who's preached this message. You carry this and carry that. Truthfully, I said, well, no, I, I don't. I don't want to be a part of it in that way. I just want to support you guys. You guys go for it. You guys, you guys got the songs. You guys got the skills, the creativity. I'm just going to be the cheerleader. And then last night, or actually, I guess early this morning, I got up and I had this thought. I said, you know, how could we call for a return to the priesthood if we despise being priest? He said, you worker of iniquity. Not you fornicator, not you adulterer, not you transgressor, but you worker of iniquity. You who have harbored, agreed with the very force that empowers the occult. It's just a root. 
no one will ever see it. But every now and then it pokes its head out when you've had a bad day and people work your nerves. You know what that's called? Dormant demons. So I said, oh, I know what this is all about. This isn't about the world hearing our music as a primary thing. This is about me. This is about Chris. This is about Constance. This is about Kirk and Jeremy and Mark, all these members of this movement, because what we want to give away to the world is not another song to add to their playlist. What we want to give away is a message of redemption. It's a return to the priesthood. It's a return to access. It's a return to intimacy. It's a return to a heart like Jesus. It's, it's not vertical worship. It's not a style. It's not an emulation of this group or that group. It's not trying to track with what is trendy. It's this call back to the original plan of God. Revelation 1, 6, and he has made us kings and priests. God said to me this morning, he said, welcome to the priesthood. Now your prayers will have authority. Now you don't have to sweat for finances. You don't have to beg and offer. You don't have to worry about Sierra Leone or Liberia or Guinea or India. Because when you enter into that priesthood, his own special people, this is when no weapon formed against you can prosper. And I told the Hope team today in training, I said, we have heard from the Lord what he's going to do at the end of the service. On the altar call, we actually have a service plan. It's actually titled, A Call to Return to Your Priesthood. And what the Lord said to me, he said, I'm going to bring people there. They're going to stay the whole time, I guess. <laughs> I hope they stay. But they're going to hear what you say. And they're going to return to their priesthood. They're going to get rid of roots of bitterness. They're going to stop despising their childhood. And even the ones who legitimately did them wrong, there's going to be a grace to love, to bless, and to honor. This lady who you see on the screen, she died at 62. Her husband, what I didn't tell you, was when she was a newlywed, a couple years into her marriage, in 1987, her husband died at 27 years old. Raising two young boys by herself, by herself, she came eventually to Ohio, got a job, and my dad and my mom adopted that family into our family. God healed her. God restored her. There wasn't a single person at that funeral yesterday that didn't have a testimony of her heart of mercy and forgiveness. One of the things that kept coming up was that she refused to grumble and complain. All of her email addresses, they were joking about how all of her email addresses were something like, God is faithful to me at gmail.com. God is faithful to me at Yahoo. God is faithful at Hotmail. It was like, that's what she was known for. And here she now is in the presence of God. And all I want to say is, if you're here today, here's my appeal. See, I had these chairs up here and I wanted them to testify because what I actually told them, and I'll tell you this, I said, you guys have lived it. You're in the prayer room. You've sacrificed greatly to steward the presence of God. And I said, today, I want you to lay hands on people when they come forward because I believe in impartation. But I realized that I guess the testimony that needed to be shared first was mine. Theirs is awesome too, even probably more so in some ways. But as the leader, the leader is not the one with the big title or who holds the mic and calls all the shots. In the kingdom of God, the leader is the servant. The leader is the first one to the cross. I've put my heart and soul out here before you. I hope it resonated with you all. But here's what I want to conclude with. I know you're here. I know you were just praising and running around. Oh, actually, you know what? Let me do this. Put that picture up there of Maurice Chapman. Maurice in here still is in the nursery. Where's Maurice at? Stand up, Maurice. Oh, you got the baby. Stay seated, Maurice. 
This is Minister Maurice Chapman. Do you recognize that picture, Maurice? That was from this morning. I walked in my office the back way, and this is how I know the Lord orders our steps. I tried everything to get into my office. The door would not unlock. So I said, okay, I gotta go the long way. I go through Pastor Carl's office, which is the back way, and I overhear this voice praying for me. He was praying, he said, one of the things I remember he said, he said, when he's preaching, may their hearts be pierced. He was in, I actually got a video of it, but the audio was kind of hard to hear. That's why I didn't play the video, but I said, you know what? It ain't just the old people. God's got some young people. God's got some young men and young women who didn't just get ordained to have a title, but are living as priests. And he was, I don't even know, I think that was preparing for the youth uh, study that y'all do on Sunday mornings, but he was just pouring his heart out. I recorded about 30 seconds of it. And I just, I didn't say nothing because I didn't want to interrupt you, but I just said, See, this is the picture of what a priesthood is all about. It's when you're by yourself, who you really are comes to the surface. And so old, young, male, female, put that graphic return in the priesthood. I want you to see this, and I want this message to wrap up this way. You're here today. Everybody pray with me for a moment. God is calling you to return to him, to your priesthood, your priesthood. I'm not gonna scream and beg you to come, but I just want you to obey the Holy Spirit. If you're here today and you know that there is a drawing of the Holy Spirit, I don't care how long you've been missing, how long you've been in rebellion, how long you've made poor choices. You're not here today of all days on accident. Even if you've been in the building every week, but your heart is kind of drifted, whether you've been a prodigal who stayed or a prodigal who went, or rather you've just been in a standstill where you've kind of plateaued and you feel like, you know, I have nothing else to offer. I rebuke that lie. God is not finished with you. And I just heard the Lord in prayer this week, he said, call them to return to their priesthood. I want every eye closed for a moment in prayers that come from a heart of faith to go forth, if you will. I still am going to ask this team to come stand and maybe two of you guys on the left, two of you guys on the right. As we pray in this moment, I want you to just stand on your feet. If you know that God is calling you to renounce Whatever it may be that has been hindering you, I want you to just right now stand up and just say, Lord, today I'm breaking free by faith from all of that. All over this room, if that's you, stand up and you tell the devil through your standing, no more, no more prayers that are hindered right here on the ground, guys. Two on this side, two on that side. Come on, all over this room, I want us to pray. See, stay soft with me for a moment. The devil has been lying to people and having you believe that you can preach, sing, and pray over top of iniquity. You don't do anything wrong, you say, but there's issues of the heart that need divine intervention. What is happening now, God showed me this was his will. And so I'm gonna ask you to come from your seat, allow Chris, Kirk, Constance, Jeremy, in a moment, I'm gonna need some others. I need probably some of our leaders especially to help, because there's a lot more people than I realized. But before you come forward, I want you to lift your hands. I wanna pray for you first. There's so many of you on your feet. So Constance, come over this way in the front here, and Carl and Gabe, you guys can help me too, and any of the ministers or prayer team, feel free to just help fill out some space here, but I, I really want to emphasize this priesthood call. Holy Spirit, come. Just ask him to come. Ask him to come. Ask him to manifest the presence of the Lord that is able, willing to heal and to save. I don't know whose childhood is being focused on by the Lord right now, but God is calling you out of that childhood trauma 
to acknowledge it and begin the journey of restoration and healing. Oh, I wrote something else in my notes. Divorce. Some of you may have been through a divorce maybe years ago. And even though you've forgiven that person in a sense, there's still a root there of bitterness, of fear even. And I felt the Lord say to call people out of that. There is other chapters he wants to tell and write in your life, but you gotta uproot the root. And so I'm gonna pray a general prayer for every person here. And for those that really are serious, like I don't want to live this way any longer. I want you to like bum rush your way to the front to make sure you can be one of the first to have a hand laid on you. We've got four, five, six, about 10 leaders up here. All right, some people is even coming, that's fine. Come on, if you feel it in your spirit. We're bringing, we're bringing this before the Lord. Go ahead and spread out. Let me pray a general prayer. If we need some more help, team, come help me. But these people, just spread on out. I see the holy, wow. Okay, we're going to pray for you. This is what God wants. We are returning to the priesthood. Father, we humble ourselves before you. Come on, everyone in agreement. And we thank you today for the breaking of the stronghold, the uprooting of the spirit of rebellion and every root of bitterness. Father, we bring it under the power of the blood. Those at the altar, just go ahead and start praying for people. We bring it under the power of the blood of Jesus. An hour and some change ago, we were running and screaming and jumping I was reflecting on the blood, the power of the blood. Come here, Jaquante. And it was because of moments like this. Because right now, the hope for every person at this altar is the power of the blood of Jesus. Come here, man. Minister Jaquante Prince Johns. Come here. Come stand right here. I want to pray for you, me, Pastor Carl. Come up here, actually. You belong here. You belong here. You belong right here. I love you. We love you. Pastor Carl, lay hand on him. We're going to pray for him and pray for everyone here. But I remember in 2014, January 5th, one of our ministers' first group to be ordained was this guy right here. And I want to say we're proud of you for your perseverance. He's gone through a number of trying times over the last few years with grief and sorrow. But the Lord who started the work in him is faithful to complete it. And so he won't mind me sharing this, I'm sure. But we, you know, we chat back and forth online here and there, just checking in how's life here and there. And I said, man, you can come to church tomorrow with no question. Because God sees you for who you are. This is not based on how we performed in the last season of life. Remember what I said. God's love for us did not begin the day we started loving him. And it does not end when we go through trials and when we have moments. His love is steady, unchanging. It never fails. When 1 Corinthians 13 says love never fails, He's talking about the agape love of God. And so, Pastor Carl, lay your hand on his heart. Jaquante, just receive. Father, you can lift your hands if you want to. But, Father, I thank you for this son in the gospel. I hope you don't take that any way. I know we, you're older, but you really are a son in the gospel. And I repent to you for not taking responsibility to properly, spiritually father you when I should have for interacting with you more on a brotherly term when I know the Lord said that he is your Timothy. He is one of the ones who's going to carry the torch for the house of prayer. He is one of the ones who's going to lead the Nazarites. He's one of those ones that you are to pour your life into. And so I repent to you for where I have dropped the ball, whether through communication or just not being more aggressive. And even though my heart's always been obviously for you, I should have just pulled up on you and said, look, man, but I was afraid of not maybe being received. So I ask you to forgive me for that. 
And I, in the name of Jesus, as a body, we restore you to the priesthood. We restore you to your rightful place as a child of God in the house of God whose life is married to the purpose of God. And in the name of Jesus, every lie, every voice of accusation that has tried to derail your purpose, we rebuke it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Father, I thank you that the fire of God would not only burn again, but would burn brighter than it ever burned. And I thank you that this testimony of the last three years would, Lord, be shared around this city, would be shared online, that the man of God that you've called him to be, he would begin to step fully into that and even redeeming the time. And I just want to encourage you, you don't have to earn your way back into right standing. There is nothing, Romans 8 says, there is nothing that we can do. There is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So Father, in the name of the Lord, we thank you for his humility, his even willingness to say yes again. And even today, if you would just give God a fresh yes, Jaquante, from your heart, a fresh yes, the power of accusation will forever be broken off of you. And Father, I pray for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I pray for a fresh anointing. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would come in power and demonstration upon him and that he would sing again. I pray Psalm 126 over him, that when the Lord turns back the captivity of Zion, we were like those that dream. We were like, you will be like those that dream. It says that their tongue was filled with singing, their, their mouth was filled with laughter, and they said among the nations that the Lord reigns. And I thank you for the restoration of his voice, the restoration of his joy, the restoration of his laughter, and the things that used to bring you joy, may they bring you joy again. Your calling and your election is from the Lord. And I wanna just say, you have more to do. You just got started. You just got started in the very broken people that you've encountered over the last few years. May the Lord give you compassion to be the greatest evangelist in this city, to bring people from darkness to light, to share your burden, your scars, your struggles. You're going to be an open book, but in your revealing your own journey of God's mercy, many will be brought out of the power of darkness. Everything the devil used to try to derail you the Lord is reversing the curse of death off your life. And we prophesy in the name of Jesus, you shall live and not die. And Father, I thank you now for the strength and the grace of the Holy Spirit to come upon him again. And Jaquante, as you've done it for years, ask him to fill you. Ask him to receive you. Ask him to put fresh fire in your heart. Thank him for his kindness and his mercy. Pastor Carl, I want you to just, if you don't mind, keep praying with him. And I don't know who, uh, I want to get maybe, uh, is Aaron Hollingsworth still here? Oh he's, oh, he's praying for someone. All right. That's fine. Keep praying for him. But Pastor Carl, pray with him. There's more for you, Jaguante. For every person at this altar, Father, as we represent ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto you. We thank you for your mercy, your kindness. And Lord, I thank you for this return of the priesthood, the first fruits at this moment right now at this altar. For many have questioned, where do I stand with God? Your status with God has never changed if you have been washed in the blood. But your awareness of your status your awareness of his mercy. May you receive it now. May you receive it now. Even if you didn't come forward for prayer, just say, Lord, I receive my status as a son, as a daughter, as a priest. He has made you kings and priests. And his inheritance is the promise of the comforter, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm not leaving you as orphans, but I will pray and the Father will send a helper. And I want us to just say yes to the helper's presence in our life. So even if you're not at the altar, just where you are, just take a moment and say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. 
Come and lead me. Make me holy. Conform me to the image of Jesus Christ. Lord God, have mercy and send the helper. Send the helper. Send the helper. Send the helper. If you're on the prayer team and you've been praying for a long time with one person, try to make your way to as many people as possible because there's a lot of people that are here that haven't received prayer. While they're making their way to you, it's okay to just talk to God because we want to make sure that we do pray. But don't, uh, don't leave until you get what you need. Liddell, Ayana, if you guys can, there's a lot of young ladies. Are you making your way over this way? Okay, thank you. There's a Raise your hand if you didn't receive prayer yet and you wanted to receive prayer. This young lady right here, I don't know if anyone prayed for her, but there's a powerful anointing on her life. I want you to just, I don't know if someone maybe already prayed, but just, yeah, pray. Father, we thank you for a fresh anointing. We thank you for a fresh baptism. We thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit for restoration of families, restoration of families, restoration of families, restoration of families. I see the Lord uprooting bitterness that we have with parents, abandonment issues. These things are not going to define you. Abusive situations, whatever the breach was, wherever the breach was, whenever the breach was, may the healing power of the Lord Jesus just say, Lord Jesus, bring your healing power into my situation. Because as he comes in, he's making you kings and priests. Lord, we want the fullness. We want nothing left on the shelf. We want the fullness. And Lord, we thank you for breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. If you haven't received prayer, can you raise your hand? There's about three or four people over there. So we, you guys go pray. Chris and Carl go pray. Is there anyone over here that had their hand raised? One, anyone else? There's, I need some of the helpers over there. I saw three or four hands. Keep your hand up and we'll make sure we try to get someone to you. This is revival. When the presence of God draws people into a path of healing. Apostle Maurice, Sierra Leone will be healed through your ministry, through our partnership, through the power of God and the vision can I pray for you? Just lift your hands, stretch your hands toward him if you're in your seats. I rebuke the spirit of discouragement that I would try to help cause him to doubt the plan or even the time of God. And Father, we thank you that the money needed, not only for this travel, but for the school, for the church plants, for the network that will serve the preachers and ministers throughout the Western African area, in the name of Jesus, we pray the Comforter would come and comfort you. And Lord, I pray right now, go put the giving information on the screen. If you feel led to, no pressure, but if you feel led to give, Lord, I pray right now for the faith to arise, for supernatural funding for the mission. And Lord, I'm asking you for a testimony before the midway point of this week. If you're here today and you want to help out with that, may the Lord uh, touch you to do that. But I just felt like the Lord said to remind you of your mission. You did a conference not long ago to bring awareness to people about missions, to bring awareness to people about the great need over in other countries. And so, Lord, he stepped out in faith. He has sacrificed time and time again. But, Lord, now we ask you, strengthen his hands. Strengthen his hands. Strengthen his hands. And the message you put in him, the testimony you gave him, the apostolic anointing you've caused to rest on him. May it increase. May it expand. May it grow. May Africa and even specifically Sierra Leone and, and Liberia and Guinea experience awakening and revival. An awakening and revival of the Father's love. An awakening and revival 
of the message of the cross, the power of the resurrection. And Lord, we speak to the mountains that stand in the way, that block the vision, that impede the progress. And we say, as Jesus said, surely I say that if you have faith, even the size of this mustard seed, that you will say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. We speak to every mountain in the name of Jesus and by faith, we say, be cast into the sea. We thank you for provision. We thank you for protection. And we thank you that it comes now, speedily, with haste. Resources come now, speedily and with haste. That even business partners that were supposed to give and were not able or said they were not able, may there be a release from every direction, from other cities and even other nations. We pray for an avalanche of provision. For never did you call us to do anything in our own strength. So in the name of Jesus, we declare the passageways are open, that resources and strength and wisdom are released to fulfill the mandate and the assignment for West Africa. So if you want to give, pray about it, but that's how you do it. Most of you know how to do it. I'm going to leave that up there. But for everyone else at this altar and at your seats, I want to let the ministry just go forth. I'm going to pray and dismiss here, but I want to ask you, make some time this week to spend a little more time with Jesus. Make some time this week to help us get the word out about Friday so we can bring a message of hope and call our city, our generation to return to our priestly identity. So Father, in the name of Jesus, would you release your blessing, the blessing of the Lord upon this gathering of believers. May there be times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Bless every family, bless every person's body with divine health. We pray you would bless everything that concerns us, that this would be a week of the manifest presence of God. This would be a week of encounter. This would be a week of like I experienced last Sunday night, times of refreshing. And Lord, we say yes to the pruning. We say yes to the rebuke that can save our soul. We say yes to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which is an invitation into freedom. We say yes to shut every door and close every window to the adversary of our soul. We say yes to be people who are pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Father, bless your people as they travel home, as they go throughout their work week. Would you cause your presence to be real to each and every one of them? We love you. We honor you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue to minister to those who would like prayer here at the altar, and we're going to uh, linger a bit as we do every week. But you are officially, I guess, dismissed. But I would encourage you to stay if you need to and press in uh, until you get what it is that you believe the Lord would have you receive. So thank you, minstrels. Y'all guys got it from here. Maybe one of our singers can help us out here on stage and just minister prophetically. Thank you, Chris. God bless you. We'll see you Friday.